So how, how are you doing today? Good, good. Doing good. good? How do you like the weather outside? <laughs> uh, I'm sorry, say that again. I said, how do you like the weather outside? The weather is awful, but I don't have to be out in it too much, so it's not bad. Yeah, I think it's been rather cold lately. It has, and windy. Yeah, for like at least what I think should be happening in May. So, you know, one of the things about that Hudson Yard thing is that the architects didn't allow for the fact that by building these massive buildings, which are 70, 80 stories high, uh, the wind from the river uh, tunnels in through the spaces between the buildings, so you have very strong winds mm. on the pedestrian walkways. That's like, not uncommon. You can see it here by graduate chemistry sometimes. Yeah, so I was just about <laughs> yeah. to say the chemistry building. Yes. That's a wind tunnel. It's, it's the, it's the uh, effect of the building. It's not the, it's not the local wind velocity. It's just the channeling effect of the wind mm -hmm. between the buildings. Was there any purpose in how the designer of Stony Brook made it? Like university? Did yeah. I, the university designed by committee. By, oh. by, it's hopeless. <laughs> Um, in fact, the original buildings, like G and H Quad, were modeled pretty much after state prisons in a way. <laughs> I see that with the architecture here. It's um, very it's like eclectic, the, you could say, right? Yeah, I think is the term brutalism. Is that it? Brutalism. I, I'm not familiar with I'm not an expert architectural on architecture. design. <laughs> yes. But when the place was first built, there were all kinds of problems. There, there were theft of materials. There were architectural shoddiness. The, the best story involved the elevator in graduate physics. When the time came to turn it over to the state, the contractor has to demonstrate that it's working. So a bunch of inspectors piled into the elevator, the contractor piled in, and the contractor said, good, press the button, now we'll go to the third floor. But he kept saying each of the floors allowed as he pressed the buttons, and people thought that was strange. And then it became obvious that there was a man standing on top of the elevator who was manipulating the controls manually because the electric system Wait, are you talking failed. about this physics building? Yeah, graduate physics, yes. Yes. Yeah, so a yeah. man was pulling the elevator Well, he wasn't up. pulling it, oh, but okay. he, he was manipulating some electrical devices back there to compensate for the failure of the system that should have been in place. Oh, my God. So they looked up, and there was this guy standing on top of the, you know, there's a... There's a hatchway in the ceiling of the elevator. They, so this man standing up there. <laughs> <laughs> That's nuts. So, so, so there are all kinds of problems with, with the things that didn't work. The accelerator building, uh, you know, the big concrete building in front of a physics, now it's, it just has concrete walls. It's, mm -hmm. it, it's the building that faces the phys ed, phys ed the uh, field house. It's, it's about just pure concrete. Right, that's an accelerator inside. The accelerator is a, was a fairly big machine, they, so they built a ramp to get the accelerator down into the machine. The accelerator is about as long as this room, maybe even longer. But they, they, it's a Van de Graaff, it's a Van de Graaff accelerator, and and uh, but they miscalculated the angle. So here, you have to envision. Uh, here, here's the the floor they have to get it to. Here's the ramp, and here's this long machine that has to fit in. So they got it about halfway, and they realized there wasn't enough room. So they had to, to because of the angle, so they had to pull the machine out and redesign the entrance. Was, I mean, all kinds of stuff like that. Uh, you would think physicists would have a better grasp of that. Who knows? Uh, engineers, I guess. Who knows, yeah. <laughs> so we're very excited to have you on. Uh, the background is very interesting. <laughs> um, so. Those who don't know, um, Lester is Paul is a nuclear physicist. You wouldn't really call me a nuclear physicist anymore. Uh, I, I did it once, but that was so long ago. Now, now my physicist friends would say he does something else, <laughs> politics or arms control. It's because you're not. My, really back, my training was in physics, and mm -hmm. I did nuclear experimental nuclear physics. Mm -hmm. But for the last, by now, almost nearly forty years, my, I've been primarily involved in arms control. Mm -hmm. Control of nuclear weapons in particular, but also chemical and biological weapons. So I, I've always wondered this question. You know, I know I know it has to do with the whole e equals mc squared thing, but actually, how does one of these weapons work? How would you build one? Well, the the basic principle involves the release of energy from the fission of heavy elements like plutonium and uranium. Mm -hmm. So it turns out when a heavy when a heavy nucleus fissions. 
it, it fissions into two smaller fragments and it emits a couple of extra neutrons, which you can talk about later. But in the process, the, the mass of the two fragments is lower, is less than the mass of the parent nucleus. That mass difference is converted into energy. So from a typical fission of a uranium nucleus, you, you get energy release that's a million times greater than the energy release that you'd get when you'd light a candle and you know, typical hydrogen plus oxygen leads yields water reaction. Mm -hmm. That gives you something of the order of electron volts, 10 electron volts or so. When you fission a heavy nucleus like plutonium or uranium, you get a million or more electron volts. So there are a lot of nuclei in a chunk of uranium, and that amount of energy is what releases, uh, it, it's released as kinetic energy of the fragments, radiation, neutrons. So you get shock, blast, radiation, that's the essence of the bomb. But it all depends upon the fission of uh, uranium and plutonium. Then you can also use, that's, that's a so-called fission bomb. Uh, that's the bombs that were dropped on, Ura on Nagasaki and Hiroshima. But you can all, the more modern weapon is a hydrogen weapon, or more technically a thermonuclear weapon. And there you use the radiation from the fission of the uranium or plutonium to induce the fusion of hydrogen-like isotopes, light isotopes. And when they come together, they too release a tremendous amount of energy. So it's that combined amount of energy that yields the energy that produces how does, that. How does coming together um, same, same way, if you, if you look at the, uh, you, you look at the two components that are going to be fused, right, and you measure their masses, and then you look at the mass of the combined product, you find out there's a mass difference again. That's And that's it's converted weird. into E equals mc squared. That's, that's weird, because I, I would, like, initially at least, I would think that it would be additive. Uh, yeah, so individual but, ones, but yeah, I guess. Yeah. But it's not. It's contrary. <laughs> yeah, it's not. Is that process bidirectional? Like, can you, it, is it, can you convert energy into matter the same way you can... Well, uh, when, when you, it, it, the same process goes on in, in a nuclear reactor, a power reactor, for example, which uses typically uranium. Yeah. And what you have there is a, it's a controlled fission process. In a bomb, you have what's called a supercritical reaction where it, uh, how, how shall I say it? If you just have enough fission that produces these extra neutrons that hit other uranium nuclei that induce more fissions, that's, that's a critical reaction. It's self-sustaining. You, you get one fission produces another and, and so forth. Mm -hmm. But in a nuclear weapon, it's, it's, it's one produces an exponential increase. Mm -hmm. So it's a supercritical reaction. Yeah. So you're getting energy and you use the heat in a nuclear reactor to boil water, to turn a turbine, which turns a generator, which generates electricity. So the energy is converted from the energy of the atomic nucleus mm -hmm. into electrical energy that's running the lights. Mm -hmm. So how is the efficiency of these bombs grown since they were first done in World War II? Well, the size, enormously, I, th I think the best way to answer it is if you look at the yields, the explosive power of the Nagasaki and the Hiroshima explosions, those are something of the order of 15,000 tons of TNT. So what blast radius is that? Well, a mile. The blast, th things tail off, so you get a blast radius that probably destroyed everything within a half mile that just flattened it. But then you have fires that are induced by the heat mm -hmm. that, that extend to a longer range, and then the radiation as well. But those weapons were 15,000 ton equivalents. A kiloton is the term that's usually used, kiloton for 1,000 tons. A modern weapon will be, uh, well, and our Minuteman three missile, for example, has three warheads, and each of them has, as I recall, about 100, if I'm recalling correctly, about 135 kilotons of energy. But the Russians exploded a weapon. We had bombs that had megatons of energy, but we don't have them anymore. We decided they're not necessary. But the Russians once exploded, Soviets, I should say, exploded a weapon that had a yield of about 62 megatons. Uh, but there's no reason to have such weapons. Even the smaller weapons are capable of really inflicting tremendous damage, mm -hmm. as it evidenced by Hiroshima and Nagasaki. Mm -hmm. so, so you have so the nuclear weapon effects are blast, heat, and radiation. 
That's how they differ from a conventional bomb. The conventional bombs just have blast and heat, but there's no radiation. Mm -hmm. And how long do the does the aftermath of the radiation last? It depends on uh, plutonium. If there are plutonium fragments, it has a half-life of thousands of years, for example. Others are much shorter. So with the nuclear meltdowns that happened in Japan, are does, is the radiation still going to like prevail there for another thousand years? At, well, they talk about the half-life of radiation, oh. as, as you probably know. Mm -hmm. That means after one half-life, you have half as much radiation as you started with. Well, that never goes to zero, but at some point it gets infinitesimal, mm -hmm. so it's negligible. Yeah. Right. So... Uh, could you still find traces? I suspect if you had sense enough, ins sensitive enough instruments, probably could. Mm. But uh, another example is we tested th uh, thermonuclear or hydrogen bombs in the Pacific on Pacific atolls. And the, uh, the indigenous people who lived there were removed, forced off the island, in effect. And the ex explosions took place, lots of radiation, radioactive dump stuff dumped there, absorbed in the soil, and wound up in the stone crabs that, uh, whatever kind of crab it is, that these indigenous people eat. And consequently, they induced, they, they absorbed some of the radioactive material. So that was, there was a slightly higher incidence of various cancers. So Brookhaven National Laboratory, not far from here, had a program for many years to go out and measure, look for the uh, plutonium and other radioactive materials in the urine of those islanders who were exposed to the vegetation and the crustaceans and mm -hmm. other things that they ate. Yeah. So it's long, long lived in mm -hmm. some cases. Yeah. We had, we used to, up until 19, what, 1963 or so, we would test nuclear weapons in the atmosphere in Nevada. That uh, fallout from that stuff would sweep across the country over a couple of weeks. So explosion would take place in Nevada, and two weeks later you could measure a trace of it here on the East Coast. Low level, to be sure. Mm -hmm. But the people who were closer living in Nevada and Utah, got a higher dose, and they, have a slight, they had a slightly higher incidence of thyroid cancer, mm -hmm. for which they are compensated by the U.S. government, as are the soldiers and Marines who were asked to go into those test areas right after the explosion took place, back when they thought we could still fight a nuclear war. So the idea was to see how troops would react going into a bombed area. Well, they absorb radiation. They, too, have a higher incidence of thyroid cancer, and they are com uh, compensated by the government now as disabled. So did we not, at that time, did we just, like, not know the effects that these... No, they, they knew, uh, I think, but they said it's a price we have to pay for to have a, a modern nuclear deterrent. And were these individuals informed, the ones actually going into the test sites? Uh, I, I doubt it. They were just told... Stay in the trench until the weapon takes place. Don't look at it because you, you don't want to be looking at the flash of a nuclear explosion. It can blind you. And then they were told, uh, you're going to be marching through it. It's no problem. Well, that's my guess. Mm -hmm. they, they, they didn't say there's a finite chance that you'll develop thyroid cancer from this exposure. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I, can't, I can't believe they actually sent people in to go do that. And they knew. And like, they knew. I could understand negligence. At that time, you know, if you didn't actually know the effects it was going to be having. But if you knew the effects it was going to be having, you sent people in there. They do from Hiroshima and Nagasaki. Yeah. After all, look, look, Madame Curie died of radiation poisoning, right, from uh, her handling of uh, radioactive substances in her laboratory. Mm -hmm. The women who mm -hmm. painted watch dials with the radioactive paint because used to moisten the brush tips with their lips to get a fine point on the brush. They all got ter terrible cancers to the mouth. So they knew. That was back in the 30s. Mm -hmm. uh, and they knew. But they said, well, it's, it's a price. It's a small probability, right? No, no one's going to die from it. But they knew. Mm -hmm. There were, uh, there, there's considerable, it still is a considerable discussion about the effects of low levels of radiation on human beings. So, so everyone knows that, yes, it prob there's no low dose threshold, they would say. In other words, there's no. And that's debatable. There are some people who say that it, there is a threshold below, below which there's no physical damage to individuals. Mm -hmm. That's the source. Uh, uh, there are people here who do research. Uh, there's a woman over in pathology whose name I could probably tell you if you were interested who f looks at that in particular. Mm -hmm. But in general, less radiation you have, the better. Mm -hmm. So where do they actually find 
the material to make these bombs? Because I'm assuming that plutonium isn't just growing on trees. Well, no, uranium, you start with uranium, you mine uranium, and it's, it's, it's a fairly common element. It, it's, you could find it on Long Island, but not a, not a rich enough quantity to mine, mm -hmm. probably. Uh, not nearly. Uh, but there are rich deposits out west and in other countries. So you start with uranium in its natural form. It has an atomic mass. It's uranium-238, mostly uranium-238. And you have to separate the from the U-238 the fissile isotope U-235 to make a bomb. That's a very complex and difficult process, and that's what the Iranians we did it. Other countries have done it. The Iranians were, on, or were doing it with their centrifuges. You need the lighter isotope, U-235, to make a bomb. Mm -hmm. And once you have that, if you have two chunks of pure U-235, uh, you just slam them together and you start, it, start the chain reaction with, by injecting a burst of neutrons somehow. And then the fissions take place, and it goes 1, 2, 4, 8, 16, 32, 64, 128, 256, 512, 1024, up. And you get about 20 generations or so, and you have a tremendous number of fissions. And each of those fissions is producing a tremendous amount of energy. Mm -hmm. So the, uh, you can start with kilograms of uranium, and you can destroy a few kilograms of uranium. And... Uh, or plutonium. You get plutonium by bombarding. You, it, it's a more complicated process, but you, you have to start with uranium to get something. Mm -hmm. you, you don't find plutonium in the earth. You can't mine it. So, so what do you think the effects are of like, of some some countries, like you said, have the facilities to actually make nuclear bombs, and then you have um, other countries like Iran, who are trying to develop the capability. And there seems to be this dichotomy of uh, power when it comes to wielding these weapons, because you have the people who have the weapons saying, we're not going to let you build the weapons, yes. but then why are you allowed to build the weapons? Then? Yes. Well, they made it, we made a deal a long time ago. We, we said, it's called the Non-Proliferation Treaty. We said, if you agree not to build nuclear weapons, even though you're an industrialized state and have the capability to do it, it would take you a while, but you would eventually, any industrialized state could do it. Uh, if you agree not to, we will provide peaceful nuclear assistance. We'll help you build power reactors. We'll give you medical radioisotopes and other things. That was the deal. And in return, we, the weapon states, the original weapon states, said, well, we will agree to work toward eventually nuclear disarmament. We will eventually get, a, get rid of our weapons. When that will happen, People will say, well, we're not ready, quite ready yet. We're working toward it. Well, yeah, and the, the non-weapon states say, hey, you promised this a long time ago. Why do you still have thousands of nuclear weapons? Mm -hmm. So you can't I answer. See, I don't see that being likely, that we would that we would give up those wep like these weapons because it's essentially giving up your power. And, you know, if you if you give them up, it's, it's like the prisoner's dilemma. You know, how do you know that you... You giving it up, and everyone else is going to give it up. You know, of course, everyone. Well, that's why you need an, an international regime. You need inspections. You, you need uh, procedures, and uh, th in principle, that could be worked out. But as you point out, if if you're concerned about your security, as uh, the North Korean leader is, are you likely to give up your nuclear weapon, which you know will keep you from being invaded by the United States or South Korea? Mm -hmm. You see, I, I most. Most people I know think that he will never agree to relinquish his nuclear weapons. Yeah, and especially there's, I mean, there's been a lot but of... On the other hand, the country that had nuclear weapons, like South Africa, during the apartheid regime, decided really didn't need them once, once the, that was about, the regime was about to end, and they dismantled their weapons. They kept the uranium, however. Mm -hmm. They dismantled the weapons, though. Other countries that had programs to build them stopped. For example, uh, South Korea once had a, a secret program to build nuclear weapons, and we told them, look, we, we learned about it, and we said, look, if you do this, we're going to have to cut back aid and other things, and you know, you're under our nuclear umbrella anyway, mm -hmm. you know, we have troops in South Korea, so the South Koreans stopped. The Japanese could probably build a nuclear weapon in a month or two if they wanted to, because they have plutonium and they have all the advanced technology that's necessary. So they've decided not to yeah, so now in these Brazil, like, Argentina, all had nuclear weapons programs. Yeah, so now in these negotiations, what what is actually being done? I don't I don't see 
I, I'm not as informed as I probably should be on the topic, but all I see is not a lot getting done. We have Trump who pulled out of this, you know, um, the Iran deal. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. And you have him going over to, you know, North Korea, meeting, meeting with the leader, and essentially, from what I see, getting not much done. I, I don't think anything really good came from that. I don't think he's willing to negotiate. But one of the things I want to know is who is actually doing the advising for these negotiations and what process well, do they go through in coming up with you know, the documents? Well, in, in a normal administration, unlike this administration, there, you have a multi-agency process. So you, you, you identify all the agencies that have, that have expertise in the, in the nuclear field. So the State Department, Department of Energy, Central Intelligence Agency, the National Security Agency, the information, the crypto, the code breakers, the Defense Intelligence Agency, the Joint Chiefs of Staff representing the armed services. So they would form a working committee out of, uh, of fairly low-level people. I mean, they're all experienced, all very smart, but uh, you have a working group. And they sit back and they say, well, if we were to have a, what would we have to do to eliminate nuclear weapons or pick, pick your project? When I served on a working group, the, pro the project was, what should we present to the Soviets as our requirements for stopping, limiting the yield of explosive weapons to 150 kilotons? So here you have technical experts in the national laboratories, uh, from these different agencies, all saying, well, here's how we would begin to proceed. Here is the draft, the first draft of a treaty. Then that goes to a more senior group, an interagency group, same representatives who build on the work of the lower level working group, but now there are more senior people, right? They're, they begin to be assistant secretaries or people at that level. Then that goes to a what's called the principles group, consisting of the secretaries, Secretary of Energy, Secretary of Defense, probably the Vice President may sit in, and so forth. And they report to the National Security Council, whose advisor presumably serves as an honest broker, saying, well, this is, this is what's emerging from this Mind you, this could take two years. I, I talked about it in two minutes here. You have a year's worth of effort. The, work, the first working group probably meets for six months or a year before they say anything, thrashing it out, because they have differences that have to be resolved. The Energy Department may not have the same view as the State Department or the, or the Defense Department. So there has to be internal differences to be worked out. They, finally, they agree. Then that has to go to the next level, and the same thing sort of happens there as well. Mm -hmm. And it gets to the National Security Council, and which has an advisor who's supposed to be the honest broker advising the president, talking about the differences between the agency positions and trying to present a consensus, if it exists, or a majority-minority opinion. Then ultimately, the president has to decide. If, the, if there are differences, he, they don't want, the president doesn't want there to be differences. He wants a final product, ideally. He doesn't want to have to make a decision between two conflicting points of view because he's not an expert. Even a well-educated president is not going to be expert in, in any particular field, right? Mm -hmm. So that's how the interagency process works. So then there's a, a U.S. position on limiting the explosive yield of nuclear weapons on underground tests to 150 kilotons. They send a delegation to Geneva, and then you, the, the Geneva delegation sits down with its Soviet counterparts, and they give the the Soviets are, the Soviets have been doing the same thing. They give us theirs, and then you try to resolve the differences between the two, mm -hmm. fighting over or arguing over language, substance, style, all kinds of stuff. And that can take a couple of years. Mm -hmm. so, so ultimately, then there's a treaty that both the Soviets and the Americans have agreed to this, to language in this treaty. I, well, I will get up now. I, think I probably have a copy of the one I worked on here in the, mm -hmm. the book. It's, uh, about, it's about that thick. Yeah. Uh, um, and, and the language is impenetrable, really. It's, it's very difficult to read. Yeah. As, so like as a, an applied mathematician, I've always wondered how often is game theory used in making these decisions? <laughs> uh, order of magnitude, probably zero. 
I asked once, uh, when I first, I, I, I served a tour in Washington on one of these delegations, and I asked as a new, new kid, here I was in with all these professional government people, I was the new kid, the, the only academic in the group, and I, I, at one of the early meetings, they said, do you ever use game theory in this? And they, they looked at me and they said, where are you from? <laughs> <laughs> and they said, well, that's academic stuff. <laughs> this is politics. This is, this is real politique. And, uh, how, how much of an effect do you think? I mean, there may, I mean I, perhaps there is some discussion of game theory, but not once in any of the, the, the sessions I ever attended was game theory ever discussed. How advantageous do you think it would be to try to employ it? Uh, hard to know. I mean, the, the political factors are probably much more important mm -hmm. than the game theoretic stuff. Well, I mean, you could definitely measure, measure those things to see how can you end up with a end deal that maximizes the joint utility of I'm sure that I'm sure I'm sure it's been done probably by uh, game theorists I, I, who've taken arms control negotiations and mm -hmm. done precisely that but the political factors are probably outweigh each side knows what it wants. Mm -hmm. the, the Russians were interested in, in getting that deal done because they thought it might lead to another discussion that would further limit American advances in nuclear weapon weaponry. Mm -hmm. The Russians always thought, it was my view, I'm not sure it was shared by everyone, the Russians felt as long as we were testing and doing, we would continue to get farther ahead. Right, and so the Russians were interested in reaching an agreement, but on our side, at first, the, the uh, there was no the the mantra from this is President Bush one now right nineteen eighty nine ninety, the mantra was that nuclear tests are necessary as as long as there's a need for nuclear weapons, so we were not to do anything that would accelerate the drive toward a ban on nuclear tests. And there were some people in the Bush administration who felt that, well, even capping the yield of underground tests at 150 was probably not a good idea because then we'd say, well, how about making go even lower to 50 or 25 and eventually maybe stop testing completely in what's called a comprehensive test ban that would ban all nuclear tests of any yield. Mm -hmm. And the Bush administration, Bush 1, now was firmly opposed to, to that. So our mantra was instructions, individual, you, you know, you, you have no individual to say about it. You can't say, well, I think that this should be, the case, that the world would be better off without nuclear weapons. Your, your job there was to represent your agency, and ultimately, to, in, in, in Geneva, your job was to represent the position of the United States, as thrashed out by the interagency groups and and voiced by the President of the United States. Mm -hmm. So you weren't there to uh, innovate or propose new approaches. In fact, if you had an idea about a new approach, you had to go back to Washington and say, the, the committee thinks it'd be interesting to know about this. What do you think? It would work its way down for the working groups, and they would have to thrash it out and say, yeah, you can say that. You know, can we use this kind of a camera at the Soviet test site? Well, we want to do this, and what do you? What would, and you'd have to go back and have Washington approve that. Mm. So it's a very tedious, elaborate, technical process. I, and I'm saying it's my sense from what I read in the newspapers, in the New York Times, and the Washington Post, or the Wall Street Journal, that our current president isn't much interested in this kind of an approach. Mm -hmm. He he thinks he can just go and meet with Kim and Kim Il Jung and. Korea and come up with a deal, fall in love and yeah. Well, right? is is that more expedient than the the process of the whole hierarchy? Sounds like it's very bureaucratic. Yes, yeah, like it's just, it's totally bureaucratic. It's yeah. right. Well, in our case, in the case of the treaty, we eventually got signed by President Bush and Gorbachev in 1990. We were still thrashing things around, but uh, then Soviet Foreign Minister Shevardnadze was invited out to uh, Secretary of State Baker's ranch out west someplace. They had a great dinner, they had a good time, and they said, let's get this done. And then we got our instructions, get it done. And so up until I would say January of 1990, we were content to have it muddle along because the position was don't go too fast toward anything that limits American flexibility with nuclear weapons. Mm -hmm. And then, then Bush, and presumably Baker, and Gorbachev, 
uh, well, I, I can only say about Bush and Baker, I guess they decided it would be in the national interest of the United States to get something done for political reasons, because there was going to be a summit in June of 1990 with Gorbachev coming to Washington. And they wanted to have something to sign to show that this innocuous treaty, which didn't constrain American weapon development at all, really, that didn't, because if you can test under 150 kilotons, you can do everything you need to do. You don't have to test the full yield of an explosion at Hiroshima power. You could do it much lower. So the, the mantra was, get it done. So our ambassador who led our delegation said, uh, ladies and gentlemen, uh, which day off per week would you like? So we no longer had weekends off. So we said, well, Geneva's uh, pretty much closed up on Sunday. You can't get your laundry done on Sunday. So we said we would like to have Saturday off and we'll work on Sunday. So we worked six days a week until roughly, I'm trying to remember, roughly April something. And we, it was about three o'clock in the morning that we met with the Soviet delegation and we realized that all the disparities and disagreements had been resolved at three o'clock in the morning. In, in April, we, we finally have the basis of a deal. Then the legal people from the State Department look it over and the Russian counterparts look it over and, and then the, all, it all sounds good. The translators all agree on the interpretation of the language and what it means. It's tricky because you know, sometimes words don't always translate well, so this had to be done both in Russian and in English. So, done. So we're, we're, we're through. Yeah, I mean there's something, there's something to be said about both Something to be said about both approaches because the, yeah. one, the one approach, information flow is too slow and it's mm. stifling and nothing gets done. The other approach, it's too fast, not, not all the ins and outs yeah. are checked and things get really messed up. Yeah. So both have advantages and disadvantages and somewhere is in the middle, but how can you actually have people walk that line of becoming a little less bureaucratic and, you know, giving more, you know, let's say, creativity and freedom to make some choices sure. on well, your own? Sure. Well, you have to have the political will. If the political will is there, if the, if the top people on both sides really want to get something done, that's conveyed tacitly to the people working below. And people will work, they'll accelerate the process and try to get it done. If, on the other hand, you're told, negotiate, it's fine, no hurry, uh, in effect, uh, that tells you something, too, and that influences the operational details of the negotiation we're sitting down with the Soviets, for example. Mm -hmm. So that, I mean, I guess that would just be in terms of how fast you want to get it done and not so much of how much individual choices do you guys have at the bottom level. Because like you said, if you had to go ask for using a certain camera, that's a little bit, at least to me, too, too bureaucratic. Well, like from... Look at it from the point of view of, uh, from the point of view, uh, the American side always thought the Soviets would cheat, that they will hide somewhere, and there are, there are ways to try to, to somewhat minimize the effects of an underground explosion, to, to make it look as if its yield is lower, even though its yield is above 150. One way to do that would be to build a big cavity, right? mine a cavity and explode the weapon in the cavity. When you do that, the shock waves don't impact the side walls in the same way they do if it's if the, if the thing is surrounded by earth. So we always thought the Soviets would cheat or they would try to test a weapon in some place in Siberia that we'd never heard of or never thought about looking at. The Soviets always thought that we were interested in spying on them, that we wanted to find out more about them. So the Soviets were very concerned about th this treaty had provisions for inspection teams to go into Russia at the Russian nuclear test site and for Russians to come into our Nevada test site. Well, the, the Soviets thought, you know, once those Americans get into the uh, test site, who knows what they'll try to steal, copy, photograph, or whatever. So you have an elaborate procedure to try to make sure to satisfy the Soviets that we're not interested in espionage and to satisfy the Americans that the Soviets weren't cheating. Mm -hmm. So that treaty language is all designed to do that. So the compromise in the case of the camera was uh, you want to take a picture, you give the camera to the Russian, or you have the Russian take the picture for you and give you the picture once they reviewed it, or there were provisions like that. Mm 
How do you know, for example, that uh, w one of the techniques for measuring the, the yield of that underground explosion was to put a cable close to the explosion and measure the shock wave as that cable got vaporized you know, from the stuff coming out. Mm -hmm. uh, the Russians said, well, how do we know that this cable that you're going to put down there is going to measure some aspect of our explosive device that has nothing to do with the treaty? You may, it'll just want to know about the in internal workings of our nuclear explosive. So we had to we had to be to develop a rationale and a procedure that would assure the Russians that all this device would do would be to measure the explosive oh, yield. Sorry, it it wouldn't wouldn't measure any of the internal electronics or any of the other gadgetry. So are you saying the person that wanted to use a different camera, they had to, they were basically checking with two people. One was they wanted to use a different camera. But they had to report back to, let's say, Washington to make sure it was okay with Russia that they used that game. In effect, any 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 change that will look really substantial. I mean, there could have been some small things that our delegation. I, I forgot the details now. It's been nearly about thirty years almost. <laughs> uh, there, there probably were some small things that we could agree upon. It was trivial, uh, for example. Uh, how do you fly the delegation? How do you fly the inspection team into Russia? Right, civilian, civilian air, military air, or what? So that that was special. We, I, I think that was resolved pretty. And there were other questions like that. Mm -hmm. Well, what what about um, I forgot medical evacuations or other trivial matters? I'd have to go back and, and look at this treaty again. Uh, so, but anything really substantial had had to go back to Washington. Mm -hmm. Do you think that chain of communication has been like in terms of how quickly? people can communicate? Has that been improved because of technology? Well, I'm not involved. It's been 30. I'm sure the, uh, the uh, technology has improved a lot. For example, when I was in Geneva, we worked in, a, in, in the United States mission in Geneva. We don't have an embassy. The embassy is not, not in Geneva. And the room in, in the mission was a plexiglass shielded room. So we worked in, it was a room like this. So envision this room, but inside now, here's this plexiglass bubble, right, transparent. The table was plexiglass. The chairs were plexiglass. And that was designed so that bugging devices could not be concealed in it. The room was electronically shielded in some way so that electromagnetic signals couldn't get out and so forth. I went back, uh, how many years ago? I don't know, about 10 years ago. And I said, oh, I'll go see the old place. And, and then it all had changed. They said, oh, it's not the plastic bubble isn't there anymore. Now it's a copper sheathed, right, to be even more secure, more impenetrable from electromagnetic radiation in or out, yeah. and so forth. So. so so there, I'm sure there are new encryption technologies, new codes, new transmission things, which I have no knowledge of. Um, so in terms of how people think about nuclear weapons nowadays, back back in the times of you know when the so Soviet Union was still together, I mean they had people you know they were in like schools and you know people were like running under desks like as if a desk was going to save them from the nuclear <laughs> the duck and cover thing. commercial yeah, but they had those they had those uh, drills and, and now since the Soviet Union broke up there seems to be not there there isn't really so much care as to can these things are they still prevalent and can actually happen and do you think it's counselless to kind of not think about it as much. Uh, yeah. Well, most people have no idea of the real situation. Some years ago, the local newspaper, the Village Times, had an editorial. I guess it was the anniversary. It was the, an anniversary of Ronald Reagan's birth or something. And they thought it had a little squib. You know, the president he died, but you know, celebrating his his birthday. And they said one of his great contributions was to eliminate the nuclear threat. In so many words, that the nuclear threat is gone. So I said to myself, think people really think that there are no nuclear weapons anymore. Don't they know there are roughly 1,500 to 2,000 nuclear weapons targeted on the United States right now by the Soviets? The Chinese had probably not quite caught up yet, but now, now there are Chinese weapons, I'm sure. Oh, they probably getting there. Yeah. So most people had no idea. Yeah. This is an editor, an intelligent person who had no idea. Oh, this is I right. had no idea that that's how you <laughs> were pointed out. <at> us. <laughs> that's insane. 
They're rough, rough, we, the stockpiles have been roost. At the height of the Cold War, what would you guess? How many nuclear weapons did the United States have at the height of the Cold War? Want to guess? A thousand. A thousand? Roughly 35,000. Oh so they're both strategic nuclear weapons designed to attack hardened military targets and small nuclear weapons designed to be used in battlefield situations to destroy a cave complex or something What's like that. Like, so, so we've cut back enormously from that. Th the Soviets had roughly the same number. And I'm forgetting the British, the French, and the others. Uh, so we've cut back a lot. Now we have roughly, of order of magnitude, 1,500 weapons deployed. That means ready to be launched within a matter of minutes. Right? They're on submarines. Seventy percent of them are on submarines that are pretty invulnerable in the deep oceans. Right? <laughs> Is that Some are in out west in the land-based missile fields in silo underground silos, with, and the balance are all ready to be delivered by aircraft. So could so you just like stumble on a nuclear? Is what? They said, could you just like be like, I don't know, walking in the desert and stumble on a nuclear bomb? Just be like, hey, what's this down? <laughs> <laughs> and and the Russians have roughly the same number. The wow. uh, Koreans, the North Korea, even now the North Koreans. Asked, I read in the paper the other day they estimate they could have something like sixty nuclear weapons. Is that enough to decimate an entire country? Because it sure sounds like you could wipe out like half the hemisphere with that. Amount. Of course you could. I mean it would. Be, uh, well, p p the prospect of nuclear war between it was unimaginable to a lot of people. Well, it was even a book. It was, the title was, was it? the title was what? The day after. It was a scenario for what the world would be like after a full exchange, massive exchange of nuclear weapons. So, what's like the threat level nowadays versus? Well, was, again, you have, in my view, the big threat. I, I think no rational leader is going to start a nuclear war, right? Because they know that. that They've had, you ask about game theory, there have been simulations held over the years where uh, uh, one side, so you've got the red, the red team and the blue team, and one side will use a small nuclear weapon in some minor battle over some, some place in the Middle East. That res results in a response with a small nuclear weapon, and it escalates, and it, many of those games have wound up with full-scale exchanges. Yeah, because it's like tit tit for tat. So if, essentially. Yeah, if you if you do something bad to me, I'll do something bad to yeah. you. If you cooperate, yeah. you cooperate. So, so President Bush got rid of a lot of the small nuclear, Bush won, got rid of a lot of the small nuclear weapons that, uh, some were small enough to be carried by two strong men, mm -hmm. right? It was, they, it was designed to be placed in, in, in West Germany at places where Soviets might be expected to attack at road junctions or bridges or other things that would be destroyed completely to, to stop a Soviet advance into Western Europe. Mm -hmm. So the, he got rid of a lot of the smaller stuff because it's really dangerous, right? You're relying on the judgment of a military commander, the local commander, to use a nuclear weapon. Yeah, I mean, because now now it's way more, it's way more complex than simply just having the knowledge of being, you know, a strategic military commander. I mean, now it's more there is a large societal scale impacts that come with like even launching one of these weapons. Of course, it's not just of course, a of course. Well, that's why people are concerned now. The, uh, the Bush administration, uh, the uh, Trump administration, is proposing to spend a lot of money to modernize its nuclear weaponry, and there's some talk about maybe even making smaller nuclear weapons that could be used tactically as opposed to strategically in a small, limited, that wouldn't trigger a big exchange. Well, you, we'd, uh, use this, we'd use this small one, but the Russians would know we have no plans to attack Moscow. We're just attacking the Suez Canal so Creek like or something. Yeah, but that's dangerous in many people's judgment. Because you don't even know where the line is. And, and even, they also argue, well, the, the, the weapons have to be modernized because they're now 20 or more years old. But there were a lot of studies that show that the weapon material, like plutonium, is probably good for 80 years. It's not going to deteriorate that much. It, it does change over time because it, it's radioactive. So when, it, when a fission takes place, it emits neutrons. It's a huge, envision the crystal structure of plutonium. It's complicated, it turns out. The crystal structure is going to be modified over the time, over time by the radiation that's taking place inside it. So, well, it could be that eventually it'll be so disorganized that it won't fission the way it's supposed to. Mm -hmm. 
So we need to modernize, we have to, but people have pretty much disputed that successfully. Mm -hmm. But the people always want better weapons, so there's a drive now to modernize the arsenal, which many people think is a mistake. But from my, my own view, the real danger is miscalculation, accidents, and the like. We've had incidents in the past where nuclear weapons were, were activated and ready to, made ready to be used because they thought there was an incoming Soviet attack. Mm -hmm. The classic case was the, uh, probably goes back to the 60s now, maybe, or could be 60s. The radar is looking over Greenland, right, which were, the Russian missiles would come over the pole, right? The radar is up at Greenland, saw something that looked like a Russian attack. Turned out it was the rising moon. The program hadn't been compensated to adjust for the fact that the moon comes up mm -hmm. over the horizon in that way. Mm -hmm. Not that long ago, maybe 10 years now, uh, Norwegians nor launched a weather rocket or the Norway someplace, you know, to go up and test things in the atmosphere. Picked up by Russia. They notified the Russians that were going to launch this rocket. But the Russians, somehow, the message didn't get through to people who had to reach. So the Russian radar saw this thing coming up and they said, it, it's an American missile heading this way. Mm -hmm. But the, the, So they activated their alert system and everything. And the then something, well, the Americans wouldn't attack just with one missile, right? If they're going to attack us, it's going to be with hundreds of missiles. So there must be something wrong here. So nothing, but that sort of thing. Mm -hmm. do, you think, do you think that there's more of a threat? Um, so one of the things I've been like throwing around in my head is if you have places such as North Korea or Iran who maybe won't necessarily make nuclear weapons, but just come up with extremely, extremely well-designed um, deployment systems of smaller weapons, such as um, from SpaceX, you see Elon Musk, he's able to now land these um, these things carrying, uh, you know, payloads, he's able mm -hmm. to now land that yes. back with no yes. landing. Yeah, I've seen that. So now you have, if, if you have places like North Korea or Iran that come up with these deployment systems that could just come back and then be sent back out to, you know, drop payloads again. How more lethal is that in terms of doing that with a bunch of smaller weapons? I, I think it, it's probably not, not at all necessary. No one's going to be talking about relaunching nuclear weapons. If, if, if once nuclear weapons are going to be used, it, it's not a matter of, well, we'll get, the, we'll get the, the missile back and we'll put another warhead on it. Not, well, not nuclear weapons, just smaller Scale conventional weapons. Weapons. well that that's a that's a good good question the question is suppose I told you you're you're now the Russians I'm, I'm telling you well look I'm going to take all the nuclear warheads off my missiles out in the missile fields out west and I'm going to replace them with conventional high explosive weapons right hundred thousand pound bombs or 300 to 500 pound bombs obviously those bombs could still be delivered anywhere in the world right mm -hmm. what do you say as a Russian well, how do I know you've really replaced them all with conventional warheads? Maybe you still have a few nuclear warheads in there. Mm -hmm. So you don't want to blur the distinctions between conventional weapons and nuclear weapons. That makes a very... Well, I'm saying, I'm saying this in terms of Iran and North Korea right now, as far as I know, don't have working nuclear weapons. No, they do not. So... Oh, which, North Korea does. They do? Yes. Oh my God, I didn't know that. North Korea has tested nuclear weapons. They probably can't reach, there's some, I'm, I'm just reading the New York Times now, right, and the Washington Post. They've tested intercontinental ballistic missiles, and we don't know yet whether they've quite mastered the art of getting one all the way to the United States, but they can strike targets within ranges of 500 miles or 1,000 miles, surely. So Japan is at risk, South Korea is at risk, and they have, they've detonated nuclear weapons underground they've tested them mm -hmm. then my guess is the current estimate i read in the newspaper is that that he has roughly 60 new something of the order of 60 nuclear weapons mm -hmm. that could be delivered by aircraft by missiles yeah so by, i guess what i'm saying is is if you have iran they don't have the nuclear weapons no but they have missiles but they have missiles that can but reach it, europe yeah and if you can make reusable missiles or just better deployment systems can that have a bigger, I wouldn't say bigger effect, but like 
a nuclear bomb going off would be a very big deal, but smaller explosives going off wouldn't cause necessarily maybe it wouldn't cause as off. much damage, but it, it would be it would prompt an overwhelming retaliatory attack from the country that was attacked. Mm -hmm. Because now the, now the systems are getting more complex. It's yeah. not just simply I mean, pointing a weapon. Yeah. You can have yeah. more complex Look systems. what we've just done. There, apparently, American intelligence has picked up some discussion in Iran that there, the Iran Revolutionary Guard was thinking about attacking American forces in the Middle East, right? the Americans in Iraq or someplace. Mm -hmm. So Bush, rather, Trump has sent a carrier in, in, out there, carrier task forces now there. And Iran... If, if they attacked American interest, how, and how you interpret interest is another question. If Iran attacks Saudi Arabia, is that, would we respond in defense? Mm -hmm. I don't know. So anyway, that, that's, but even if Iran doesn't have nuclear weapons, they're going to be pounded if they attacked any American interest, however one defines those interests. Yeah, because I'm thinking the next wave, because um, nuclear obviously is a big deal, but one more AI-driven weapons come about, they can maybe not have the environmental effect that a nuclear bomb will, but maybe could hit the same kill counts or even higher. If you're very strategic with it, like um, they have drones right now that can let, uh, that are operating on swarm intelligence. So they all can act as a group and mm -hmm. go out and go for a certain goal. Yes. Now, if you have them just going out to, let's say, some town and just, you don't blow up the town, you just kill everybody in the town. How much of a problem is that compared to nuclear weapons? Because these things could then just be deployed out anywhere. Well, it's much easier to use a nuclear weapon. And, and what, one, one explosive device is going to do more than... Well, we'll look back. In World War II, we deployed massive numbers of B-17 bombers to bomb Germany. Right? A typical a raid might have a thousand planes. Right? You can now do the equivalent with one plane or one missile and one bomb. Yeah, but so, the so I think he means that, like, um, be it one nuclear bomb or a thousand drones, the retaliation is going to be the same. I think that we would retaliate in the same way. Mm -hmm. In fact, the, probably the current American position is we, we have not signed or, or stated that we will not be the first to use nuclear weapons. That's called the no first use agreement. Mm -hmm. Right. We have conspicuously avoided saying that, so we reserve the right to use nuclear weapons in response to any attack. Mm -hmm. Now, is it likely that we would use nuclear weapons to respond to an, uh, an Iranian, say, missile attack on an American carrier in the, in the Gulf? Probably not. Well, cause but we, have, we, we want the uh, potential adversaries to know that we reserve the right to do well, that. Well, the one problem I'm thinking of is that if you are a country that launches nuclear bomb, you can certainly know that this is going to have not only an environmental impact that's going to come back and bite, you know, you in the ass. Mm -hmm. You're, so it, w it would not be advantageous for you to launch that and have it come back and affect you in a very uh, negative global scale. But if you were to launch such as these AI-driven uh, weapons, you can reach the kill count maybe that you're looking for you, and not you, have the environmental effects. Yeah, I don't think I don't think you can get the kill count really. I don't know. It's I don't think so. It's getting it's getting pretty pretty crazy with some of these uh, weapons. If you can have things that can basically just search and destroy. Well, without just just do the arithmetic. All right, uh, the, the a single warhead on an American Minuteman three is 135,000 tons of TNT equivalent. How much could you put on a drone? I think you'd be lucky to be able to put 500 pounds, two, more likely 200 pounds of explosive on a drone. So you do the arithmetic. It's how many drone attacks would well, these, you need? These aren't carrying nuclear No, but weapons. conventional TNT. How much could you put on a typical drone that you might, in the swarm? Well, you wouldn't want to do that if it was me. <laughs> if it was me, I would want to arm them with just, you know, uh, like machine guns and such, mm. or or something of that nature, something that isn't going to destroy the drone. Why would so I want to destroy my? Drone it sounds team? like what you're advocating for is more of like a surgical, precise way. Yeah, it's like you're not yeah, destroying yeah. things. You're not blowing yeah. things up. You're going you're calculating in. just eliminating everybody. <laughs> well, you you can't have. A, you're not going to be able to have a, a, a machine gun on a drone that's going to do any 
significant amount of damage, probably. Mm. Yeah. Anyway, the point is, a any attack is, is, is going to risk a re an overwhelming oh, yeah. retaliatory attack, even with, with conventional weapons. Mm -hmm. if, if Iran attacks any American interest in the, e in the Middle East now, uh, Bolton, the National Security Advisor, has been eager to strike Iran preemptively anyway. Mm -hmm. And if he persuades Trump that a, a big response is appropriate, we would attack Iranian communication sites, facility, God knows what. Mm -hmm. it would, it would, they, would, they would pay a terrible price for an attack on an American force, given the current administration's position. Mm -hmm. Now, would bio-warfare um, like, receive the same sort of response? I think if we were attacked with bioweapons, mm -hmm. we uh, they have an enormous potential for killing millions of people, obviously, if, if, it, if it's an infectious disease mm -hmm. that's uh, spread. But I think uh, if we were attacked with bioweapons, if we knew who did it, it's, it, would, it might be difficult to know who did it, right? I think I don't think we'd use a nuclear response. We, uh, probably not. Mm -hmm. What about, so there's a lot of um, trouble going now with information warfare. So what you have is people who are going on social media, especially from Russia, who are trying, trying to, ha trying to make inflammatory discussions? Because I theoretically, I could train an AI bot to be roaming around, let's say on Facebook or Twitter, targeting certain comments that if it knew, okay, I see this response here, I classified it as this, as this type of comment, and I know that I can produce a comment back to yeah. it. Well, I'm that sure will, that's being done that now. Will, that will maximize the number yeah. of negative responses yeah. it gets. Well, I think you know much more about that than I do, uh, but it's now being apparently being done. It was done in the uh, 2016 election, and mm -hmm. it's been rumored. I, I think I was just reading today that the Russians are firing up uh, cyber attacks again in, in a variety of ways. Now, when, how... How much do you think? You, is using actually, social media to mm -hmm. plant false information to to foment dissent in the American electorate. Yeah, and one of the and one of the things is that is would that lead to any any physical military action? You know, because this is it's a it's a very weird thing. Your because, guess your guess is good as mine. <laughs> I, I don't know because you have people messing around with your information. It's some sort of psychological warfare, and I mean, I don't know exactly what would be the response to that. I'll, because we're the biggest users of it. Mm -hmm. That's the problem. You know, we're we're the ones using it so much that it, targeting us would be the move. But then, what would be the move back? Military action? Well, I, feel well, like I know there's been a little discussion, and I'm not current on it at all. But I, I've heard there was some discussion about possibly having treaties that would limit the use of cyber weapons in the same way that treaties limit the use of nuclear weapons. Yeah, and that, now, that's uh, it's so hard you, to you, you, you think about how complex it would be to have a treaty to do that. How would you monitor? The, you know, you have yeah, because... One, one, one guy on a computer someplace, how, how do you do that? Well, mm -hmm. one of the problems is, is how do you know the user's fake? How, of you course. Know, yeah, they could yeah. be a real user from Russia, which you wouldn't want to ban them necessarily because they're from Russia. And of that's course. that's the only reason. So trying to actually identify these fake accounts when they actually look like yeah. real accounts yes. is such a big problem that even if you wanted to monitor, like in, in nuclear weapons, you can say, all right, I want the yields or whatever to be certain this. We'll come in and inspect. Yes. But in this case, you're you're having the problem of, I'm, I don't, we can't even measure if you're doing anything. Well, the, the Mueller investigation apparently did that and they concluded, uh, as has the intelligence community, that there were concerted Russian attacks that were pretty effective in the 2016 election. I mean, it's, it, the intelligence community seems unambiguous about that. Mm -hmm. So the Russians did that exactly. How would you prevent? How do you do it? How do you prevent it in the next election? I mean, I, again, I'm not enough of a computer geek and AI person to know. Isn't there some sort of responsibility that we have as American people who are using these platforms that we shouldn't just trust and rely on social media to inform us? Hmm. Yeah, I know that's a problem with me. Because, <laughs> mm -hmm. mm -hmm. sure. uh, oh, but really, you know, I, I'm so busy, you know, trying to get all my work done, you know, going to work, mm -hmm. that the news that I catch 
is just me going through my news uh, news feed in the morning, mm -hmm. and that's about it. But mm -hmm. you know, knowing because I make stuff like that, I'm seeing stuff that either I want to see or gets me very mad because it seems like showing you articles that get you very mad will have you interact with the articles more. I see. So you're maximizing yeah. that by showing yeah. these things that just get yeah. you angry. Well, in your situation, you don't have the time, but, but there are people who have nothing else to do whose sole job it is to monitor these things, and presumably they can uh, try to sort out what's real and what isn't. And yeah, but... It's this, tough. I think it's difficult. It's, it's difficult because the scale of how many comments are made each day is way more than the number of people there are. Yeah, I'm sure that's true. Yeah. And how are you going to have, let's say, a company of maybe, I don't know how big Facebook is, but you know, let's say 24,000 people. Even if you had 24,000 people trying to look at these comments all day, sure. they're, you're nowhere near getting the coverage that you actually need to prevent these yeah, big I, I, I can believe it, yeah. Yeah. Well, these are the, the powerful forces have been unleashed. I'm not sure people understand yet uh, what the consequences, long-term consequences, will be. Yeah, and I think that. But well, Trump has how many? How many Twitter followers? Probably millions, right? Many millions of followers. Mm -hmm. So he can reach. He can put out a statement, and it's out there to millions of people. Mm -hmm. Who no. have no way of verifying anything about it, who have no idea. Yeah. Just that he said it must be what uh. Yeah. I mean there's some there's some people like there's definitely a distinction between following because you want to be in the loop of what's happening and following because you like that person. You know, like you can I follow see. a group just yeah. to see what they're up to. You know, you, you want to know what's I happening see. over there. <laughs> I see. So it's like reading yeah. Mein Kampf. Yeah. Just to see what it's about, yeah. but yeah. not yeah. necessarily yeah. Exactly. Yeah. Like, yeah. advocating yeah. for the idea. Yeah. Well, look, I'm, I'm sure there are people, uh, unlike me, you know, I, I, I don't mess around with AI and web stuff, cyber war, but I'm sure there are people who do nothing but, and, and you hope that they, they will be able to come up with strategies that minimize the damage. Mm -hmm. um, oh, oh, yeah, there was something else. I In my case, let me just say, in my case, I tried to read across the political spectrum. So I'll read the New York Times, the Washington Post, and the Wall Street Journal. That's about all I have time mm -hmm. to do. Mm -hmm. And you've you got a variety of opinions. So you have the Wall Street Journal on the one hand and the two more liberal centrist papers on the other. Madeline, I read once that Madeleine Albright, when she was Secretary of State, read not only those three papers, but she read the Financial Times and a couple of other European papers and that she could read in English as well to try to try to keep up. Yeah. Issue. So one of the things Trump is seeming to perpetuate, and I and again I don't know if this is actually true because I'm not as informed as I should be, <laughs> but he's essentially saying you know they pulled out of this Iran deal because he says it's a terrible deal, it's bad. Is there any truth to that? In my view, it was the best deal that could be negotiated that had flaws, and one could have addressed the flaws and, and tried to improve it like rather than just pull out of it. Notice the other, the other partners haven't pulled out of it. They want to keep it. The European partners, and including the Russians and the Chinese, want to keep it or have been still trying to honor it. And now Iran has said, well, because of U.S. sanctions, we're, we, you know, we're, we're going to back out. We're going to not do all the things that we agreed to do because the, the Americans are punishing us. So I, th I think the deal, it was certainly not a perfect deal, but it was the best that could be negotiated. That all five, I guess it was five, or I forgot now, five or six nations thought this was the best we can do. And it should have been maintained. And it ev has evidence by the fact that the other partners would still like to have us get back into it. So what were the flaws in it? It, why a 10-year limit on it? The, the, the deal extended, as I recall, for 10, roughly 10 years and said after that time, Iran would be free to do a couple of things that it's now prohibited from doing on the original terms of the deal. And, and why, Trump would say, why can the Iranians develop missiles that, that should have been included as some part of the deal, not just nuclear weapons, but the missile delivery systems? So, forth. so there are other other things like that. I'm sure you could pick any agreement and say, "Well, this could be a little better." Yeah. And so so it's just a bit rash to just say. Rash. I I thought it was a big mistake.
-hmm. because we have, under the terms of the deal, we have inspectors, the international community has inspectors going in to Iran. The Iran stopped producing things that they shouldn't be producing. They had to ship out a lot of uranium out of the country and so forth. So it was a great improvement. Mm -hmm. So perfect, no, but it was the best that could be get, obtained at the time. Mm -hmm. So is there now an alternative being developed? Not by, uh, not that I've heard. The Europeans are desperate to try to keep the Iran. See, we are now punishing the Iranians by we've cut off trade and we've told the Europeans that if you trade with these Iranian co companies, we're going to, you will be subject to sanctions as well in some of some sort. So that's upset the Euro Europeans considerably who trade on with other things, other you know, cars and mm -hmm. usual commercial exchanges. They've been threatened by the U.S. With punishment if they trade with Iran, mm. so they they would much rather have the uh, the original deal back, and they're trying to persuade the Iranians not to completely pull out of it. Iran has said we'll start we'll start enriching uranium again, to the process of taking the uh, uranium that doesn't work for a bomb and turning it into uranium that would work for reactor fuel and other things. So all so, oh sorry. Sure, go ahead. Um, all of the development that's being put towards making weapons, if that was instead funneled into creating clean energy using like nuclear reactions, how how much how developed would we be in that area? Well, I think the, I think the future resides with uh, nu nuclear power will have some place. Mm -hmm. I think right now it's very difficult to build a new a big power reactor. Mm -hmm. It costs a lot of money. There was there one on Long Island. There used to be one about 10 miles from here, but mm -hmm. it was shut down after it was completed, mind mm -hmm. you, because no one could figure out an evacuation route. Mm -hmm. if, if the thing had a massive problem, how would you evacuate the population on, on, on one or two roads that we have running the length of the island? So that, we're still paying for that. That was a, roughly a $5 billion plant. It was shut and dismantled, but the company that built it had to be paid. So electric rates have been jacked up here on Long, and Long Island in particular mm -hmm. to pay off the cost of, de of demolishing that plant. Now, do you think that nuclear energy is the energy source that we should be using? Well, I think it should be. It, it, we need renewables, right? We, the, the big benefit of, of nuclear energy doesn't contribute to the carbon effluent, no CO2 coming out of a nuclear plant. Uh, on the other hand, there's a small probability that you have an accident. So I think the wave of the future for the nuclear component, in addition to wind and solar power, geothermal power, which we should be exploiting, I think the nuclear program of the future might rely upon, instead of one massive reactor whose, whose damage could be substantial if there was a big accident, maybe smaller, cheaper, modular reactors that would be sprinkled around to provide power to smaller areas and new designs that would be more fail-safe. So and the people are, are working hard on that. In fact, uh, I guess I left it in the car, I can, the nuclear journal. I'm sure that that journal would have an article on the advances in modular. How do you convince the public that these these things aren't dangerous? Because there's there's so many things, like even saying, you know, one, they could like list Japan. They've they've protested against things such as Rick, yes. Rick and you know uh, yeah. BNL. Also, you know in Geneva, uh, CERN. You know they've protested against these things. They don't understand what's the path to making or making it more clear the actual threat level of these things. Well, it's it's, it's a problem because people a lot of people think that a nuclear plant is likely to turn into a nuclear bomb that there could be a nuclear explosion. Mm -hmm. That can't happen, right? The worst that you can happen is the reactor vessel fails. There's a there's a steam explosion or something. Something melts and you spew radioactive debris mm -hmm. into the area, as in Chernobyl, right? So that's that's a real problem <laughs> and that needs to be dealt with. One way to do it is to have a better reactor design that uh, 
is, 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 well, put it this way, and let, let gravity do it. So if something fails, instead of having an electric failure that prevents you f something from happening to stop it, try to work it out so that gravity will f cause the thing to stop. You know, the, the electric power goes off, something just falls in and stops the process. Mm -hmm. If a valve fails, somehow there's a diversion and the, a reservoir of water comes in and, and cools the thing off. Mm -hmm. People, the nuclear engineers spend a lot of time thinking about safer reactors, and a smaller reactor would not pose as much of a risk. It, it's, it's one of these things. It, it's a very low probability of an accident, but significant consequences if it takes place. So you want to try to even make that probability of the accident lower and also minimize the consequences if an accident does take place. Mm -hmm. So eventually, my guess is, uh, what fraction? So we haven't even begun to explore the solar, wind, and geo potential, geothermal potential yet. But prices are coming down now, they're pretty competitive. And I think nuclear power, smaller nuclear plants might play a role in that. Mm -hmm. Because you, they don't depend, you know, the solar and the wind powered thing depend upon battery storage in some way when the wind stops and the sun stops shining. You need batteries or you yeah. have to pump water up into a tower or a, a mountain reservoir that can then flow down if then drive a turbine once the electric, once the sun stops shining and the wind stops blowing. Mm -hmm. So, nuclear power it doesn't have that difficulty, right? You can run it like a generator. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. um, so there's a place for it, but it needs to be. How you persuade the public is is, is another matter. The public, as you say, is not well informed. Yeah, I mean, I'm also seeing that with the whole anti-vaxxers thing. Mm -hmm. So there you are. I mean, how could it be that you, you have the anti-vaxxer people? How, how can that in this age? How can yeah. it be? Yeah, I mean, having these outbreaks and then people asking on social media, "How do I prevent this?" Uh -huh. like, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, we have a Stony Brook grad. You, you, you should talk, talk to one of our grads. She was a student of mine, could be 10 years, maybe more now. Her name is Renee Duresta. She's a prominent person in the computer field. And, uh, she's the leader of something called Vaccinate California. She's leading a drive out there to... Uh, she was just in New York last week. I didn't have a chance to see her, though. She was on a panel at Columbia University talking about some cyber something or other. Uh, she was a double major here. She majored in computer science and Russian at the time. And, but she's leading this Vax California project out there. She would be an interesting interviewee yeah. for you. That sounds very exciting. I would love to and she's coming to New York in June, she told me. She'll be here in June. And I said, well, we'll try to work out a lunch or something. Um, so anyway, there's a place for nuclear power, and I would leave it to people who are more informed on nuclear engineering than I am to talk more specifically yeah. about mm -hmm. the advantages of modular reactors that have more fail-safe things designed. So if something fails, gravity helps. Yeah. You, you don't. Um, oh, well, it seems like there is an additional um, incentive for people to want to remain dependent on coal because it retains, you know, people's jobs. And that was one of the main reasons why. Yeah, but it's, the, the, the number of my coal miners, mm -hmm. I'm hardly an economist, but it's my understanding that the number of coal miners has plummeted greatly over the last decade or so. So the number of jobs in the coal industry is, is not significant anymore. Right. So are those skills transferable to, say, being able to like develop nuclear power plants? In today's New York Times, no, I, I don't think so. In today's New York Times, there's a very interesting article about an effort made in West Virginia to take coal miners and teach them coding oh, and do yeah, other I've stuff. Oh. And it, in, in brief, it has not worked. Mm -hmm. There, there well, may have been some evident, elements of scam involved, oh. and it's not clear to me, but it hasn't worked. Mm -hmm. Well, because you're, I mean, in that case, you'd be taking, let's say, 50-year-old people and trying to trying to teach them they just have absolutely no experience like no experience with it and just you know yeah. throwing them into it and be like oh you're halfway through your life learn software yeah I mean, I, yeah I was well, they were pitched with a 15-week course that was supposed to be free then they got there and they found that it wasn't free mm -hmm. there was a small charge mm -hmm. and they were told you complete the course there's all kinds of jobs out there for coders 
but the whole you have to read the article. It's a very, very interesting article, it, and you have a problem with the culture as well. There's the culture of outsiders coming in and saying what your your values, your culture is not working. You got to do something different. Well, that's resisted, understandably. Mm. Yeah, uh, that's a problem mm -hmm. in in Appalachia. All right, so. So I think those minor skills are not directly transferable. Mm -hmm. You'd have to retrain people, and you'd have to relocate them because you, uh, just, uh, who, what industry is going to want to locate in Appalachia? Mm -hmm. It's pretty far. You, you not, can't produce anything there. It's too expensive to ship it out, other than coal. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, like if you're going to become in software coding, you most likely, you know, Go to New York or Silicon yeah. Valley to Look, try to find a job. Big manufacturers don't even want to locate on Long Island because how do you get this stuff out to the country on the Long Island Railroad? You know, I mean, yeah, the my Long friend, Island Expressway. Yeah, my friends in engineering say that you know they're not going to be finding too many jobs on Long Island because it's just not where you would want to do, you know, all this large scale manufacturing. Well, Grumman uh, was the big manufacturer on Long Island for many years. They turned out. Uh, Components in Bethpage. They assembled the, the fighter planes out at Calverton and Riverhead. It was a big operation, but with, that shut down for whatever reason. They broke. They don't. Do, Grumman exists only with some software people here in Long Island. Yeah, I live, I live right by Bethpage, so I, pa I pass by it a lot. And yeah, it's pretty much empty. Looks like a. I don't know. Like well, years ago, I would take students out to Calverton to look at the um, uh, the final assembly facility to, as the F-14s were put together, mm -hmm. and we knew the chief test pilot, so he would give us a tour of the plant and we'd get to see the planes. All gone. Mm. Wow. There, so I think, as far as I know, there are no big manufacturers of anything on Long Island anymore. Mm. Maybe some electronic places back toward Huntington. Yeah. Yeah, probably. This university should have been placed in Huntington on the 110 corridor. They made a mistake in putting it out here. Because mm -hmm. that's where you know, the... Yeah, Route 110. The, oh, no, is that, no, that's not Route 110. No, that, isn't that... Oh, no, that's Farmingdale, right? Yeah, it, 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 yeah that's Farmingdale. That would have been the ideal place. Mm -hmm. Not too far from an airport. Uh, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. But they got the free land here, so they wanted it. The land is free, we'll put mm -hmm. it here. Mm -hmm. Wasn't it uh, Ward Melville? Ward Melville, yeah. yeah. Who made a lot of money in the process because he figured once the university is here, then the value of, of the surroundings, which he owned too, would dramatically increase. So he got a tax deduction for the land donation. He put in, I don't know if you know it, but uh, he had restrictive clauses in the deeds for downtown. So no Jews, no blacks, no Southern Europeans could own property there. That's pretty crazy. That's a legacy ruin. <laughs> <laughs> that, that, those, that's all overturned now. Of course, it was made illegal. You can't do that. It has been gone for many years. But the original deeds restricted had deeds which restricted the transfer. Mm -hmm. That's pretty crazy. Um, the the Ward Melville Foundation gets upset when you remind people that. <laughs> I'm sure they'd be very happy. Yeah. I mean, they should look at the popular. We got the, list we got the Melville Library, right? Yeah. Right, right? <laughs> if it was the Robert E. Lee Library or the Stonewall Jackson Library, people would be out there with signs saying, uh, "Why name buildings after racists?" Yeah. Slave yeah. owners. But, I mean, that's that's a big problem. Well, uh, some some say it's a problem. I I don't know if I actually if it was like Robert E. Lee, I think I would have a problem. I don't know. I find the whole protesting because of things being named thing a little childish. I just don't think it's it's worth the time of protesting because you can essentially deem anyone to be racist if you're thinking that whatever acts that happened were racist. Not to mention also not giving context to the time. You know, people, they didn't think, like people think that if I just look back a certain amount of years ago, they should be thinking how I'm thinking of now. Of course, yeah. And it's you, like, you, well, it's not. You, can, it you can make that argument, sure. You know, because otherwise then we could just say, well, why were, you know, why were Romans having these arena fights, you know, people mm -hmm. killing each other in the middle? They should be thinking like I was thinking. Mm -hmm. It's like, no, you know. Yeah, yeah. Well, I look at the football games pretty much like gladiatorial <laughs> sports. People yeah. get, getting brain concussions <laughs> to amuse the mass. Yeah, because there's this big thing in Hofstra going on. Uh, my friend goes there. Uh, these people are really 
hell-bent on trying to get this Thomas Jefferson statue knocked down. And they just, like, they just don't want it there. They're like, he's racist and owns slaves, you know. And it's like, you can understand maybe that point of view, but I think there needs to be more credit to the context of, you know, when these events, you know, were going on. Of course, yeah, you can say that. Because eventually, you know, you could, you could also make the argument that the statutes, or rather the... Uh, you know, the Constitution that was put in place led to the freedom of these people, you know, by way of the system, which maybe it wouldn't have come about if it was, you know... Well, the original Constitution, as you know, had no had no, no intent whatsoever to grant freedom to anybody, to, to the, certainly to the slaves, mm. right? It, in fact, it had that three-fifths provision. The, the southern states wanted who, after all, representation in the House of Representatives based on population. They had a lot of slaves. So they wanted the slaves to count. So they said that each slave would count as three-fifths of a person. Yeah. It's, the language is still in the original Constitution. Now it's been long since superseded by an amendment. Well, because I'm saying the framework in which it was built led to that, meaning you could make an amendment that would, like, let's say, overturn that. Yeah. You know, you're given the framework to be able to actually work yeah. towards building, you know, paving the way for... The society that you would well, I think there were even debates among the founders about, about how far they, what they could do. There was some of them recognized the immorality of the slavery system mm -hmm. and wanted to do something about it. But you know, how do you, how do you keep the southern states on board? Well, yeah. You know, you have to compromise in some way. Well, yeah, I mean that was a problem. It's like if you were to make this nation, it was some, something had to give in order for this to be built, and it was. You know, it was either that or now you're going to have to be fighting a war separated with, you know, them being uh, loyal yeah, yeah. to, you know, Great Britain yeah. and then the North being separate. And would the war have been won? I, I don't think so if, if it wasn't united. Yeah. But eventually, I mean, the framework led to yeah. you know, that being dealt with. Yeah. Well, look, there were plenty of slaves in New York City mm -hmm. prior to uh, abolition. Mm -hmm. You know, there were, there were slaves. There were traders. Harvard had a lot of money, went to Harvard from slave trade and so forth. And people are now looking at this and say, why are we naming the Calhoun Hall? And I guess it was Calhoun Hall at Harvard and mm -hmm. so forth. Robert E. Lee was a slaveholder. And not only that, uh, he was, I don't know if you know this, he was, he, he, there was a woman who tried to escape. So he asked that she be administered a particularly vicious beating, whipping. Not just be punished, but also be brutally whipped. So Robert E. Lee, you know, the hero and the statues all over the South. So if you were black, maybe you'd feel a little differently yeah. about having statues named after Robert E. Lee. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I could see. And after all, race is still a very racist society in many ways. Yeah. Yeah, definitely. But in terms of the scale of since the 1960s, it's not the same. I don't think. I don't think people are being shot down with hoses. I don't think that people are. It's, it's surely better, yeah, I agree. You know, there's there's things to be said for the improvement because, um, I mean, other things... Look, we had a black president. I mean, so well, yeah. so things... Yeah, it's like among other things that you see, people won't be like, well, it's, it's not it's not perfect yet, but it's there's no acknowledgement to things are getting better. Day by day, things are getting better, and it's not particularly... Um, useful to think about everything with such a negative exaggeration towards it, you know? Well, th again, I think if you were a black person, you might be concerned about the pace at which things are getting better. You still have a very impoverished population who's, the, what, the, uh, it, I'm guessing is it, net worth of a typical black family is probably a third the net worth of the average white family and so forth. Well, Incarceration rates among blacks and so forth. Well, I mean... Why, why are the blacks all concentrated in the inner city? Because they couldn't buy places in the suburbs. Mm -hmm. And I mean, definitely, I think, you know, like money should be going towards inner cities. But to also talk about, you know, poorness, it's also relative. It's also relative to what you're, you know, keeping, keeping fixed. Because if you look let's say, at poor people, most of the poor people in the U.S. are white. And that just has to do with population. Yeah. We just have more white people than black people. I think it was, what, 60 or 70 percent? 
white, like thirteen percent black, yeah. yeah, and you know other other denominations. Mm -hmm. So there's considerably more, you know, poor white people. Sure, but I think it also sure. has. It's like you know, there's there's problems going on everywhere. Everyone is facing very hard problems. I mean, look at you know West Virginia. You have these coal mining communities where these people, no one's got a livelihood anymore. They're just kind of, you know. All, all on drugs over there. Imagine being born to like one of those families or into one of the inner city families. Sure. It's a very difficult. Uh, I think more attention has to be going to not necessarily race, but socioeconomic status. Yeah, I, sure. No, no one would uh, dispute that. Yeah, sure. like especially on like college applications. I, I don't know why race would have to be put on. I would want to know your income because that definitely affects mm -hmm. what's going to be, mm -hmm. you know, what your school is going to be like. What's what's life like around you? Because yeah. whiter. Well, you could you could make the argument that uh, you you want to have a diverse undergraduate population. So you don't want, don't have a situation where you never meet a person with a race other than yours. So there's some I think arguments can be made for diversity, mm -hmm. for some sort of affirmative action with with race being a factor as well. You want to have some representation of minority communities here. Look at Stuyvesant High School. In Manhattan, you have, are you familiar with the arguments that are going on there now? Stuyvesant is uh, as an elite high school examination only admission only by examination, right? So the, the score in the exam is the sole determinant. Doesn't matter what else you've done, right? They admitted eight hundred and some odd students, and this latest go around was seven blacks, mm -hmm. right? So people are saying. How can we change this? How can we say not only an exam but also evidence of leadership? Blah blah blah. blah. Now, were they controlling for your economic status? Don't. No, it's no control. Well, that's what I'm saying. If I if something were to be controlled for, I bet that if you controlled it on economic status, you would have a a lot uh, a different outcome than well, that. Well, it's being contested. The, the De Blasio, the mayor, and his allies want to change that so it's a different admission process, not just the exam, but also rank in class and so forth. Mm -hmm. One but would be to admit every valedictorian and what's the other valedictorian That's from Lutheran. high school is, is admitted to one of the select schools if they want to come, you know, without making them come. And right now, Stuyvesant is, I think, 80% Asian American. Yeah. Right. Then the Asian community is saying, "What do you mean? Now we work hard. We're studying. Uh, we, we, our kids have made it purely on the basis of the exam. If you start bringing in other factors, then our community is going to be poorly represented. We will lose seats, and we've worked hard to get those seats. So there's a big uproar. The uh, Stuyvesant alumni group doesn't want to change anything. Yeah. I mean, they also have that at Harvard. I mean, they're getting sued. Yeah. yeah sure. Yeah. Sorry. I mean. Because These things of that, yeah, well, because of that, have to work out the same thing. But now, also, the assumption of saying that in this school, let's say, I want a certain proportion of people to be a certain race, that's assuming that because your color of skin is different, you're going to be thinking differently. If the real thing that we want to be looking at is, you know, what's in your head, you know, the content of your ideas, why would I want to know? what your skin color is. How is, like, basically the yeah. assumption would be Look, because the, the you like that, you think differently. The affirmative action issue has been argued and will continue to be argued for many years. It'll eventually, there'll be, surely cases go to the Supreme, more cases going to the Supreme Court. Yeah. And you could, you, the arguments on both sides. The Asian community in, in New York says, well, look, everybody has an access to these, uh, to prep courses and doing the things that people do to prepare for exams may or may not be true, depending on income. Well, yeah, they, like if you can't pay for it, you can't yeah. get those. But they, I think the city has, has tried to provide some free prep courses as well. Mm -hmm. Now, suppose you live out in the boondocks, up, up in far away in the Bronx, and the free prep courses downtown. Maybe it's a problem getting there. You maybe can't afford the subway fare, for all I know. Mm -hmm. But anyway, many, many factors. So we'll, so we'll see how it plays out. Yeah. And I, one of the things I wanted to talk about was in terms of the like uh, the human rights. So from what I've heard, that seemed to take a back seat in terms of when uh, the Trump administration went to North Korea. Like they didn't seem to have a hard enough stance on, you know, you that, can't be that, killing that's, all these that's, people. That's understating it as far as I can tell from the press. It's not clear he raised those issues at all. 
So, Nor has he raised the issue of the uh, Chinese imprisonment of the Uyghur community out in Western China. So now why do you think that was done? Was that done for any strategic reason, if there was one? Was there any legitimacy in actually meeting with them? Uh, I think it them? should be protested. I, I, I think, uh, what is it that makes, makes our country special? The only thing that makes it special is our democratic system, our values, and the like. We're no smarter than anybody else. Right, but we've managed to put together a system based on the rule of law and respect for human rights and democracy. So we ought to be advocating that all, all over, it seems to me. So you you want to deal with us? You have to show us that you are valuing human rights and yeah. democratic, democracy. Mm -hmm. North Korea, China don't make the cut. Yeah, I feel like him going over there, I, I feel like it was some sort of whim of him maybe thinking that he could just, I don't know, woo him with his personality. <laughs> the deal, that that the deal, the right? <laughs> he could make the deal. Yeah. And now, of course, yeah. the uh, Times had that broadside last week, which you may have seen, showing that he's the busy, he's the biggest money loser in American history well, in billion, many ways. One billion dollars, right? Yeah. He, he was, he's a terrible businessman, apparently. <sighs> yeah. that's. But he said, well, it's it's... It's a sport. He said you got a lot of losses and you could deduct it so you don't pay any income tax. He didn't pay any income tax. So you have this man with his gold-plated apartment not paying income tax. Something's wrong with that system. Well, I mean, I think the same thing happened with... It, uh, I, not necessarily the same person. Actually, I don't know if Jeff is, but Amazon not paying. Exactly. Or I think you mean Apple. Yeah. That well, that's why, people sure feel, that's why people that. feel oh. the system is stacked. That's why the real progressive, the, some of the newly elected representatives are arguing for a radical change. I'm not sure they're going to be successful. You know, free this, free that. Mm. Oh, well, so yeah, I'm, I'm a bit hesitant on that. Actually, I'm very hesitant on that. But what I could say is calling for some sort of breakup of these tech companies because I just think they're too large. I think they You can see, and it seems things. to me... Uh, in the last day or two, I've read arguments both calling for the breakup of Facebook in particular and arguments why, maybe even today's times, with an op-ed piece saying why Facebook should not be broken up. Maybe regulated, but not broken up. Do you feel that there are I, new Standard I, Oil? I, I'm not. Uh, I, th I think you have to talk to an expert economist to have informed views on these matters. <laughs> mm -hmm. I just read, read it and try yeah. to understand the issues as best I can. Um, Another question I had about security was something I don't think a lot of people think about nowadays that at least I think about it has to do with prime numbers. So one of the hypotheses, uh, well, one of the problems that are out that are hoping to get solved. How is many people do you think could even define what a prime number is in the American <laughs> population? Actually, much, I think, I think much a, less a, know anything about the conjectures people. or... You mentioned, say, Goldbach conjecture mm -hmm. to someone, and, and you'll see a total blank, even among college-educated people. Mm -hmm. I mean, mathematics taught terribly in the United States, and people have no notion of what prime numbers are, or what the interesting conjectures are, or the theorems, or anything well, about I think it. The, but finish, go oh, ahead. But yeah, it's not just about maybe an interesting conjecture or anything like that. It's about what are the repercussions of if this is actually solved. For crypto. Yeah, because sure. people don't realize that everything that's encrypted is with these large prime numbers. Yes. However, if you can actually find quickly these large prime numbers, the entire information security that we have yes. in place yeah. is gone. Well, that's for, If the quantum computers get realized, they'll be able to do that. Yeah, and then my question is, <laughs> is anyone thinking of something to put in place? <laughs> <laughs> are, we, are we actually thinking about what happens when this is no longer a viable way to encrypt things? I think, I'm, I, I think I've read that there are people thinking about that, and they are thinking about systems that would uh, even be resistant to quantum computer attacks. Hmm. Yeah, but I, I, I don't know enough about that to, to speak intelligently about it. Yeah, because I think if they actually were able to do that, would they, would they be able to access these nuclear like weapons if... They could. You, if, well, right now, all, the, all the, the, the signals issued by from Washington out to the military commands are surely highly encrypted in every way. If, if those commands could be 
understood by an adversary, that would not be good. So I'm sure that's a concern to people who think about the command and control of nuclear weapons and how information is transmitted to the commanders who would actually launch the weapons. Mm. Think of the submarines. Submarines don't have hard wires running out into the oceans, right? So it's difficult to communicate with submerged submarines. To come, they have to get closer to the surface, and they don't want to surface because then they're, not, then they're vulnerable. Mm -hmm. So they trail typically trail a wire, a long wire, a long antenna that's right at the surface. And then they can transmit and receive messages slowly, to be sure, because of a number of problems. But you can communicate with them. If, if, if that system were broken, how would you communicate with a submarine commander mm -hmm. safely and tell him, do this, do that, or launch, or don't launch? What provisions? Uh, people write novels about this stuff, right? Here's the submarine. He thinks there's a war that started, but he can't communicate with Washington. What is he to do? Should he launch? Because he thinks Washington is, or he thinks the United States has been attacked by the Russians or the Chinese or somebody. What should, but he can't communicate. What should he do? Mm -hmm. Yeah. You know, it's the stuff of movies and novels. Yeah, but it's certainly very real. Because, of course I mean, it, yeah. as, as we're seeing, I mean, they are making uh, certain strides to actually, you know, solving it. So, making certain? No. Uh, yeah. All right, so the one is the Riemann hypothesis. Um, yeah. That's the one. That I know. Seems I know to the be, Yeah, it seems to be if if you actually if they actually find a path for proving it, then that path would provide a way to then you know generate or find maybe like what the end product could be. Or something yeah. Like that. yeah. That's the trouble about the premier unsolved uh, theorem. Yeah. Right? Yeah. It's very big, and they are making progress towards it. I'm just like like other look they did. Uh, what was the uh, Fermat's last theorem, right, was proved finally yeah. by the guy at Princeton. Andrew Wiles? Yeah. 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 In yeah. like 92? We got, we, you know, have very, we have a very powerful mathematics department here, right? Yeah. So there are people here who, uh, we, we've got uh, Fields medalists and uh, yeah. a number of other people who've received these distinguished awards in the world community for their, so there are people here who could tell you more about that than I certainly can. Yeah. Um, and I think, oh God, what was I thinking? I lost my phone. <laughs> um, oh, oh yeah. Now this is completely off topic. My head is jumbled around today. I can't <laughs> around. Um, one of the things is, if, this is back to North Korea. If North Korea is actually able, do, do you think it would be better to just let them run out and all, I don't know, collapse, or to try to do some sort of destabilization ourselves. Because one of the problems is seeming like China would just, like if something did destabilize, they would just hop right in and take over that part, not necessarily like Well, us. China might not, because they would be inheriting a poverty-stricken nation, just as the West Germans were very leery about absorbing East Germany when Germany was unified. China's main concern is to have a, not to have a U.S.-dominated peninsula. China's main concern is that if the nations were unified, the South Korean strength would overwhelm the economic incapacity of the North and its, its military leadership, and eventually you'd have a unified Korea that would be pro-American. That's a Chinese concern. The other concern is that if a war breaks out, forget the nuclear war for, for a moment, but if a war broke out in, in uh, North Korea, there'd be a massive flow of refugees, poor refugees from North Korea into China, and they don't want that either. So the Chinese are up the creek. They don't know exactly what to do. They don't want the Americans there. They don't want a war. You know, they don't want North Korea to have nuclear weapons. They want to be the nuclear power in Asia. So that so case, it seems to me it would be that they want to, would want to go in there if it's yeah. unstable. They, they, want, they would be quite content to have it stay the way it is, I think. Pro yeah. pro Chinese, they're the China and North Korea, are the main trading partners. After all, they'd be content to have it stay that way, and they would just. Unfortunately, it's not going to be that way because North Korea has now it has nuclear weapons. Mm -hmm. Chinese were not happy about that, but they couldn't control the North Koreans. Yeah. I used to talk to my Chinese friends. And say, how come you know you're so close? How come you can't persuade them? So they would say, "Oh, the North Koreans are crazy." <laughs> but the North Koreans remember the results of the world of the Korean War, where they were bombed heavily 
everything was bombed in North Korea. Everything, every every town of any consequence was bombed, whether or not it had military significance. There was essentially a free fire zone. Mm -hmm. So they remember that, and that's been propagandized into the mindset of average people who see posters showing Americans bayoneting babies, mm -hmm. dropping babies down the wells, and so forth. So they really are afraid and and of of, of American invasion. Mm -hmm. and, and the leaders have capitalized on that, right? They, only recently have North Koreans had more access to what's going on in the world via cell phones and CDs are smuggled in and so forth. Yeah. So the hope is that maybe eventually there'll be some revolution, internal revolution. They'll move toward a more democratic system. I don't think it's going to happen in my lifetime. <laughs> yeah. How long have the problem now is the military had been pretty much isolated from because the, they, they ate well, they had access to stuff. Now, because of the increased sanctions, the military people are beginning to, to hurt a little. Their spouses are having to go to work. They can't get the same privileges and the same luxuries of life that they once had. So there's some thought here on our side that, well, maybe a disenchanted military will force Kim Jong-il out and lead to a more accommodating kind of relationship. Mm -hmm. Last thing I think we want is another war with North Korea. Yeah. Seoul would be destroyed. Yeah. Millions of people would be left, hundreds of thousands would be killed, and millions would be left homeless. Yeah. Because it's within range of North Korean artillery. Yeah, I mean, there seems to be also a lot of people on our side. Um, Actually, I have no idea if it's a lot of people on our side. I just know that there is talk of, you know, people want the military removed from all these countries and just bring everyone back to America. Now, I don't think that's viable because I think we want to know what's going on in all these different places. Because we really spread, after World War II, we spread out everywhere and we're just kind of like holding ground. Well, presumably we have, we have diplomats, we have spies. We have Central Intelligence Agency, we have Defense Intelligence Agency, we have encryption, we have NSA that can monitor communications worldwide. Satellites can pick up cell phone emissions and so forth. So we wouldn't be, I'm not arguing for total withdrawal, but I'm saying we wouldn't be totally cut off from that. We would know what's going on. So was the Syri like the Syrian withdrawal, was that... You, you can, Good or you, bad? Because I, I don't it's know. Hard to, it's hard to It's complicated. It's so complicated. Mm -hmm. well, what, they, one withdrawal was a mistake. was Obama's withdrawal too early from Iraq. That mm -hmm. led to the rise of ISIS and all the stuff. These are very complicated issues. I, I, there's, there's no school solutions for any of these things. Yeah. yeah that, and, and from my point of view, I have a... I read, I try to read widely, but I, I try to just appreciate the magnitude of the problem and, and I can see the complexity of it all, but, but I have no clear proposals for solutions. Because mm -hmm. like, what, what, would be, what would be the cons of pulling all of our military out? In some cases, well, where are the big deployments now? In South Korea, we have something like 25,000 troops in South Korea. That's a tripwire. The North Koreans know if they were to attack North, uh, South Korea, Americans would be involved right away. So that's a deterrent from an attack. That's the only main reason it's mm. there. Right. We have uh, troops, some troops in Germany, for example, again, so the Russians don't get too many ideas about going in. So you can see the argument for having some deployed people in various parts of the world. Yeah, kind of acting in, as a serving, In, in some cases, smaller groups serving as advisors to militaries, advisors to the uh, Iraqi army, uh, to the uh, POC, you know, to try to contain, in, in Afghanistan, for example, advisors to the Afghan military and so forth. Not clear it's going to work. I mean, mm -hmm. the Afghan military is hopelessly corrupt. Yeah, so I guess the I guess the pros would be establishing this. I would say like, not physical border, but like having people there is a border enough to say if if we do anything, we know that you know they are going to be involved right away. So it acts as a border, in a sense, having those people there. Again, I can I can see a role for advisors in in some cases, but whether you need large deployments. 
even Trump, for example, wonders why we're paying so much for troops in Europe. You know, he wants to see NATO nations paying much more than they are now paying. Do you think that's a fair argument? NATO, I, th I think NATO is, is enormously valuable. We should do everything we can to protect NATO. Mm -hmm. So we don't want to have that. Well, Putin would be delighted to see the NATO alliance fragment. And from Putin's point of view, Trump's actions uh, or, it, or advancing Putin's objectives, I'm mm -hmm. sure. So I think we've got to keep NATO in place. Mm -hmm. It's got problems, but what, what would it be like without NATO? Uh, you'd have a fragmented defensive system that would make it vo more vulnerable. Putin might be encouraged to take uh, back Latvia or Estonia or any of those northern nations that once were part of the Soviet Union. He took Crimea back already. He would like to take Ukraine, no doubt. Mm -hmm. back and under the Russian umbrella. Yeah. So if he's permitted to do that by having NATO fragmented, the Estonians and the Latvians are concerned about that, I assure you. Mm -hmm. All right, should we wrap this up? Um, yeah. Okay, well. Well, thank you for coming out. Okay, thank hope this is useful. <laughs> Maybe you, you can edit it and get something coherent out of it. I think I think it was very good. Yeah. I learned I learned a lot. You know, because I'm not I'm not the biggest history person, so you know, learning stuff in school about history, I wasn't so interested. I was just very interested in math. Mm -hmm. But now, as I'm going on, mm -hmm. I am interested more in terms, of, you know, like what's what's going on around the world and mm -hmm. just how complex it is because to me it's also interesting at least mathematically like complex because mm. i mean i like solving problems so mm -hmm. you know i see these problems sure. and i just try to look and see if there's maybe any sort of mathematical solution that could be imposed on it or guide. well i think if you did some research you would find that there are some social scientists who try to use game theory and other techniques like that to look for optimum to try to optimize situations i've seen a study with that with rats they they had so they had these these rats that were there, um, and these they would come and play with one another, and these big rats would always beat these little rats, right? And it was an iterated game, so you would have these rats come back the next time, fight again, next time fight again, next time fight again, and what they found was that the bigger rat would let the smaller rat win thirty percent of the time, and the reason why was because if he went any more. The little rat wouldn't want to play anymore. <laughs> I see. I see. They used to have a game theory conference every here every summer. Did you know about that? Uh, they bring game theorists from all over the world here. Yeah, cause we have we have a very strong algorithmic game theory um, uh, community here. Because I mean, some of the leaders in algorithmic. Game yeah. What year are you? You're graduating, or you got another year or two here? Um, I'm right now in graduate school. I'm getting my master's in statistics. Yeah, I see. So you're going to be around for how long? Um, this summer. Yeah. Your guys in, in Applied Math will know about the Game Theory Conference, I'm sure. It's, it, they've held it every summer for as long as I can remember, so I would be surprised if it wasn't being held. But they bring in very distinguished people. Yeah. Yeah, because we have, we have some very smart people, like Eugene Feinberg, mm -hmm. um, you know, is one of them. I'm super interested in, like, mm -hmm. you know, stuff he's researching. Um, some people I know are, you know, doctoral students of his. They they typically they'll bring a Nobel laureate or two in for that game theory conference. Yeah. There'll, be, there'll be a panel with three Nobel laureates sitting up there. Yeah, it's pretty crazy. Also, Simon Center. The Nash, right John there. Nash. Remember the Nash? Yeah. Or Nash was here. He died. He was killed in an accident a year or two ago. But uh, but it could be three years ago. He was here for the summer program. Oh wow! I had no idea. Yeah, but your guys. I thought he was dead. <laughs> uh, he, he was killed in a car crash in oh my like God. Jersey Turnpike or someplace. That's that's crazy. He was, a very, he was a very quiet mm -hmm. uh, man, not, not an exuberant person, but there he was, John Nash, man, that's no, crazy. Nobelist, along with a couple of other Nobelists from NYU. Yeah, they also had um, in the in the Simon Center. I, I forget the name of the guy, but he solved. Uh, I forget how to pronounce it. Poincaré. Poincaré. Yeah. yeah, yeah. He he solved that. He like. Okay, the well, they had the guy who did the work on the uh, the uh, prime. What was it? the uh, twin prime problem here about a year ago? Oh, really? You know, you know, you, you know the conjecture. There are infinite number of twin yeah, primes, yeah. right? Well, the guy who showed that within this range, there are 
blah, 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 you know, sort of leading toward the proof of the twin prime mm -hmm. conjecture. Yeah. Man, that's pretty cool. Yeah, for our math department here, we got some pretty, it's it's pretty good. Yeah. Well, I should ask, since you're a game theorist, you should, you should ask about it. Oh, I'm not a game theorist. Ask, ask about, well, you know, I mean, ask about the uh, summer program. You, know, you surely learn a lot by yeah. uh, sitting in. Yeah, I definitely like to, like to dabble. <laughs> okay. <laughs>